The title is The Believer's Sojourn Through Life, and it is just that, is it not? From the moment we get saved, God begins to work out his eternal plan in our lives. And as we continue through this earthly life, God is bringing about certain situations and so forth like that for the purpose of building us up and making us strong, giving us a strong faith that we might be able to endure the various trials and tests that we face. There in John chapter 16, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Now in the world you'll have tribulation, and I'm sure we can all agree with that. But be of good cheer, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. So he, painted, he pointed to himself. Now, when he said those words, he was just hours away from the cross. But Jesus said, even at that point, I have overcome the world. Now, we have much to learn, as I said, from the Old Testament scriptures. When Paul wrote to the Romans, he said these words. He said... For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. Now, when he wrote these words, the New Testament as we know it did not exist. So obviously he is referring to the Old Testament. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So we're going to go back into the Old Testament here in the book of Exodus. And you recall the story of when God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. So we're going to start with that. So the entire history of the children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan is one long Old Testament type. And the things that happened to Israelites, the Israelites are pictures in, hist in a historical pattern of the things that happened to us in a spiritual pattern. Therefore, by personifying the nation of Israel, especially the wilderness experience, we can see a picture of the believer's sojourn through the Christian life. So we're going to be looking at a lot of events, a lot of experiences, and see how maybe those things apply to us. Events, persons, or statements in the Old Testament are often seen as types, which are events that prefigure events and persons in the New Testament. For instance, Moses is somewhat of a type of Christ, being that deliverer that God used to deliver the people out of the bondage of Egypt. So the typology of the Old Testament is rich and varied, and types can be connected with such persons as Melchizedek, Joseph, David, with objects such as the tabernacle and the temple, with rituals such as the offerings and the feast. They all have a New Testament application. Going back to the Apostle Paul, he made an extensive reference to the Old Testament by way of types there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the first 13 verses. So using those scriptures, he went back to the Old Testament to give us the account of the Exodus and what took place. But through it all, he gave a teaching so that we could learn lessons from, those, from that wilderness experience. So he said there in 1 Corinthians 10, 10, 11, now all these things happened to them, that is the Israelites of old, as examples. And they were written for what? Our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages has come. So when we go back and we read and study the book of Exodus, it's more than just history. God had a purpose in recording all of that so that we would have a proper understanding how God works in our lives. As we look at Moses, now Moses we know was called by God to be the means whereby God would deliver the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. And as such, Moses is a type of Christ who delivers us from the bondage of sin. So you see that pattern being carried through all the way from the Old Testament to the New. Now the place where deliverance was given was, was given to the Israelites. And, of course, we know that originally they were in the, in, the, in the land of Egypt. And so the account there in the book of Exodus opens up with the children of Israel in bondage in the land of Egypt. And throughout Scripture, Egypt is a uniform type of the present world in which we live. Now, you and I, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, and I trust that you all do, at one time you were, so to speak, in Egypt. 
You were in bondage to this world. The horrible taskmaster of Satan who controls the world. But because of Jesus, who is our deliverer, he has delivered us from that bondage, from this world, and given us life and freedom. So, much like our world today, Egypt in those days was not without its own splendor and glory. It had an advanced culture and a splendid civilization. It was rich in the arts and sciences. Its religion was a strange mixture of gross idolatry, as we know, plus advanced theology and occult mystery. Now, the means whereby God delivered the Israelites was, as I say, through Moses, but through some interesting experiences as well. God told Moses, Now Moses speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for his household. Now your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it into the, on the 14th day in the same month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Now picture this. Moses telling the Israelites, each one of you guys need to go out and grab a lamb. It has to be under a year or more or something like that and bring it into your house on the 10th day of the month. And you are to keep that lamb in the house until the 14th day. <coughs> Well, you know, hearing that from Moses, you'd have to wonder, okay, um, why would we do something like that? Nonetheless, they had to bring that lamb in, and that lamb had to stay there for four days. Now, picture, the man brings that lamb in. The children probably give that lamb a name, right? It becomes a household pet, and they love this little lamb. But on the 14th day, that lamb has to be killed. I think about there in John chapter 1 where we're told about Jesus. He came and dwelt among us and we, became, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. So Jesus came and he lived with us for a period of time. But after that period of time, he was murdered, he was killed, he was sacrificed as his lamb. Now the means of deliverance again uh, <clears throat> was given to the Israelites was very strange. We're told that people... Uh, we're told that they had to take that lamb and kill it on the 14th day and then take that blood and spread it over the doorpost and the lentils of each home. Now, if you were an Israelite living in that day, you would say, perhaps, why would I do something like that? That seems really strange. I've never heard of anybody ever doing that before. Why should I do that? <coughs> For them to do that, they really had to take a step of faith. Now, we know the Egyptians... They were told also the same thing, but they did not do that. And as a result, their firstborn was taken from them. But not for the Israelites, because they took that step of faith and did exactly what Moses told them to do. And of course, with that blood being spread, the death angel passed over those homes. So they were to take some of that blood and put it into the two doorposts and the lintel of their houses. And as a result, God then guarded them by obstructing the foe so they did not lose their firstborn. We're told that the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them, so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israelis. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to one, and it gave light by night to the other so that so that the one did not come near the other. So even after the Passover, when God delivered the people out of Egypt, God also afforded that greater protection for them by this cloud, which is to one was complete darkness, that is to the Egyptians, but to the Israelites on the other side of the cloud, it was light. Now that's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's a miracle in itself. But God did that to protect his people because of his love. And also because centuries earlier he had given a promise to Abraham that one day he would deliver those people, his descendants, out of Egypt. And God is going to follow through on that promise. Now, as we look at that, we see the New Testament application. That is the cross of Christ that brings separation. We're told in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them, the world, 
to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Does the cross not bring separation, you know? A lot of people, you know, just ridicule the cross. In fact, we see society trying to get rid of every mention of the cross, right? More and more all the time, because it's foolishness to them. And so therefore, this cloud, which separated the children of Israel from the Egyptian, was both light and darkness, very much like the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, as that cross forms the foundation of the believer's peace, but at the same time seals the condemnation of the guilty world. So the cross is truly the dividing line. So that separation that is needed to be practiced by us as well, because G John would write in his little epistle, do not love the world, neither the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But as the Egyptians pursued the Israelites, so the world will be relentless in pursuing believers or us, trying to draw us back into the world. But as that pillar of cloud and the fire separated the Israelites from the Egyptians, so must we, so must we cling to Jesus, separate ourselves from this world. That's why it is so very important to keep ourselves separate from the world. There in John 17, Jesus prayed this prayer. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they, that is my disciples, may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the word has hated, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So we are to maintain lives that are separate from the world. As God separated the Israelites, the children of Israel, from the Egyptians, so does God want to separate us from the world. So we're looking at the separation that God provided for the Israelites of old. And that night, we're told, having spoiled the Egyptians, Israel marched out of Egypt. And the journey was off to Canaan. The promised land had begun. However, not all of those who came out of Egypt that night were blood-bought Hebrews. A motley crowd of adventurers seized this opportunity to win freedom from the irksome circumstances of Egypt. So we're told a great mixed multitude went up with them, that is the Israelites, and their flocks and herds, and a great deal of livestock. So now you have this mix of people. These are not God's chosen Israelites. These were Egyptians who thought, well, this sounds like a pretty neat adventure. Let's just go with them, you know, and see what happens. So they go along. Now, they, they proved to be nothing but trouble because later on, this very same multitude, this mixed multitude, infected the faith of the Israelites and then prompted them to grumble and complain. We're told in Numbers 11, verse 4, Now this mixed multitude who was among them yielded to intense craving. And so the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? When we mingle with the world, when we maintain close associates with the world, their worldly mindset will infect our minds and get us to do un you know, ungodly and worldly actions and perhaps words and thoughts. So therefore, all the more reason we must maintain a separation from the world for our own protection, because the Israelites did not do that. And we'll see that they paid a great price because they did not. So, going back to that separation, in the same way we must guard ourselves from the vain philosophies of the world that come to us in every single direction. We're told in Psalm 1, which is a great introduction to that psalm, Blessed is the man or woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the sea of the scornful. Let me say this to you. Go home and turn on the TV. Listen to the news. What will you be hearing? Won't you be hearing the voice of the world? And if you listen to it long enough, pretty soon it'll just take over your thinking, right? 
and now you'll be griping and complaining, I just can't believe what's going on in this world. This is just terrible and so forth and so on, right? You'll be complaining. But we're told, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Jude tells us that false teachers and apostates infiltrate the ranks of believers by secrecy. He said there in his little epistle, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. These are ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So Satan is always trying to infiltrate the minds of believers with false teachers. And he is continuing to this day doing that. Jude goes on to say, These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. This says to me that the devil gets these false teachers, like the mixed multitude, into our churches. And pretty soon they're right there with us. Don't you believe the devil who is so deceptive would seek to do that with us here at New Beginnings? He will bring people in here in order to draw us away from the Lord, in order to infect his false doctrine and worldly mindset into the minds of believers. So we have to be on guard. Going back to the Israelites, of course, we know the Red Sea experience. As they came now between the Egyptians and the Red Sea, what do we do now? Well, the Lord told Moses what to do, and so thus Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided so that the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Israelites, of course, were delivered in a rather miraculous way through the Red Sea, and that was somewhat their baptism. As you go back earlier to the Passover, that was their somewhat their Old Testament salvation experience. That's where atonement took place and their redemption. But as they pass through the Red Sea, that is a type now of their baptism, so to speak. And so off they go. But as it came to pass, we're told, in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians and through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. He took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty, I would think so. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them and, and against the Egyptian. And of course, we know that the Lord destroyed the entire Egyptian army plus Pharaoh himself. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Now the importance of the parting of the Red Sea is that this one event is the final act of God's delivering of his people from slavery in Egypt. The exodus from Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea is the single greatest act of salvation in the Old Testament and is continually recalled to represent God's great saving power. So that was God's first very notable deliverance that he brought to a people there in the land of Egypt. And so throughout history of the church, there is now an anti-type, which is just the opposite of a type of the Passover and the crossing of the Red Sea, where people get saved by placing their faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and are subsequently are then water baptized. Symbolically, they proclaim that their old life of the bondage of sin is behind them, representing the going down into the water. Their coming up out of the water depicts their new life in Christ, and so that's why water baptism is so important. Now, water baptism, as we know that the Bible teaches, does not save. Only our faith in Christ saves. We are saved by grace, right? But nonetheless, we're told and commanded, really, to follow the Lord through baptism because it's a great opportunity to testify the things that God has done for us. And also, it kind of illustrates the separation that we've now taken on as a result as being saved and separated from the world. Once saved and baptized, believers into, <clears throat> enter onto a road of sanctification, a road filled with many purifying trials that contribute to a growing faith and love for the Lord. Through the years, I've taught a new believers class. 
And I've often say to them, now that you're saved, you've entered into a battle. You're now facing a terrible enemy, and he wants to destroy you. Now that battleground is a rather small piece of real estate. It goes basically from ear to ear. That's the area that we've got to conquer. Because that's where the battle takes place. As the devil seeks to, seeks to inject ungodly thoughts into our mind that will eventually translate into words and actions. So we need to conquer this area. And how do we do that? With the truth of God's word. Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the Lord will allow us to go through times of testing for the purpose of building up our faith. Now, the important thing of it is, is to be aware of that moment of testing as to what the Lord is doing. And to just give everything over to Him and allow Him to have His way. Now, a word from Bible prophecy. <clears throat> We're told there in Jeremiah chapter 23, an interesting word concerning now that deliverance out of Egypt. We're told, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all of the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. So God is saying, yeah, that deliverance out of Egypt was an, am an amazing miracle. But there's coming a greater miracle. And that is when God will deliver his people out of the far countries where they had been driven because of their disobedience through the years. Well, guess what? We're seeing that happen now, right? In our generation, the Lord is doing that. Coming up in May, Israel will be celebrating its 70th anniversary. Interesting thing of it is, you know, the U.S. through Trump and our president has decided that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and the, in, the embassy is going to be moved there in May on that 70th year of, Israelites, of, of Israel's anniversary. As we continue on and looking at that journey, now the most direct route to the Promised Land was along the Mediterranean Sea coast, a journey that would be, well, basically just a few days. And so there you see, that would be the most direct route into the promised land, right? Now that promised land belonged to the Israelites. God had promised to the descendants of Abraham that they would have that land. It was already theirs. But God didn't allow them to go directly into that land. Why? Why did he not allow that? As we look further into the journey... In order to protect these people, we're told, God did not lead them along that route because the Israelites would encounter the Philistines. We're told in Exodus chapter 13, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near or close, for God said, Lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. So God did not lead them by way of the most direct way to the land. So why? Because we're told that way was really close. But God was concerned that when they would encounter the Philistines, they would get terrified and head back into Egypt. He was trying to protect them from making a very bad choice. Now, 40 years earlier, Moses would remind, 40 years later, Moses would remind the people that the particular route that God had chose for them, uh, and this is the reason why. He said, now it came, I'm sorry, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to humble you, and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. So God puts us in situations where he can test us and also humble us so that he could know, and he already knows, but we could know what was in our heart. 
and whether or not we will keep his commandments and obey him. So thus God didn't go the, the most direct route. He went a different route. And we're told as they begin to move on their journey, the first stopping off point was a place called Mera. Mera. So we're told in Exodus chapter 13, so Moses brought Israel, I'm sorry, chapter 15, that Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea when they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Merah, they could not drink the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of the place was called Merah. And we're told, therefore, God made a statute and an ordinance for them there, and he tested them. So why did God take them there? Well, when they got there, what did they do? They complained. Do you ever find yourself complaining because of your circumstance? I do. And these people complained. But they didn't understand at the time that God was testing them. Yeah, he put them in a situation where they did not have water to drink. To see if they think, well, boy, God delivered us out of Egypt through lots of miracles and so forth. Therefore, he can provide water. He wanted to challenge their faith and get their faith to grow. Now, God often allows a bitter experience to confront us at the outset of any new venture. For him because he wants us to trust him. And so the solution to the problem there for Moses and the people was, was quite simple. God just told Moses to cast a tree into the waters, which upon his obedience, the waters were instantly and miraculously made sweet. And of course, this tree is a well-known symbol, another type of the cross. Moses directed them in type to Calvary. And all of our bitter experiences will be made sweet when we accept them in the light of the sufferings of Christ. The cross of, the cross of God's provision is for every trial. Uh, last Monday, Meryl and I, we had to go to the dentist, our, you know, our six-month checkup and so forth. We just get our teeth clean. And I said to the dentist, you know, the only pain I've really suffered in my lifetime is getting my teeth clean. I've never had to go through anything else beside that. But every time I get my teeth clean, I just really dislike that whole process. But every time I get my teeth clean, I just think about Jesus on the cross. It's not so bad. <laughs> it's all right. I get through it. Okay. So the cross is God's provision for every trial. There in 1 Peter chapter 2, we're told these words, For to, to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor did he threaten revenge when he suffered. What did he do? He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. So here's Jesus being tried before the Sanhedrin and the high priest. And they are accusing him of all kinds of things. But Jesus did not retaliate. He did not answer back. What did he do? He committed all things unto the Heavenly Father who judges righteously. He understood that his Heavenly Father could deliver him out of that situation if that had been his perfect will. But Jesus had bound himself to do the will of the Father at all costs. And so he just gave everything over to him and allowed the Father to carry out his will. And if his will was to drink that cup of suffering, if his will was to endure the cross, then so be it. Because he knew that the Father's will was perfect. It could not be improved upon. And I think that's a lesson for us. That when we come into a situation that's difficult and uncomfortable, perhaps with even suffering involved, then we just have to hand everything over to the Lord. He being that master potter will continue to mold and shape our lives for his glory. Going back to the Exodus journey, we're told in Exodus chapter 15, then God made a statute and an ordinance for the people there as he tested them. And again, he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the, heed the, heed the voice of the Lord your, Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. 
Going back to Jesus and what Peter said, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Aren't you thankful for what Jesus did? He gave us more than just healing from some earthly sickness. He healed us from an eternal sickness. The eternal effects of sin, which would lead to death. That's the greater miracle. That's the greater healing. And truly God is the Lord who heals us. Going back to the journey of the, of the Israelites. Next, we're told they go to a place called Elam. A place called Elam. And what is Elam? Well, we're told they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. So in comparison to Mara, where they had water they couldn't drink because it was bitter, now the Lord leads them to, El to actually it's Elim, where there are 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. Kind of an oasis. Somewhat of a paradise in comparison to where they had been. And so often the Lord gives us a time of peace after he allows trials so that we can be refreshed, nourished, and prepared for the next trial. And that was the case of the, Egypt, of the Israelites. God take them, took them to a place so they could be refreshed and get replenished. And so when we look at the early church in the book of Acts, God did the same thing. There in Acts chapter 9, the early church was going through a tremendous persecution. But then after they had passed that time of testing, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they were multiplied. Now, as you, go, as you look through God's creation, you see a pattern that repeats itself over and over again. For instance, in plant life, plants, they have a time of growing and a time of resting. Notice this. So often God provides relief and deliverance from trials so we can be refreshed and also be stabilized for future trials. So as we look at something like this flower, you see it grows for a while and then it has a period of rest. And then it'll grow for a while and it'll have a period of rest. And that's true of all plant life. For those of you of young children, you perhaps notice that there are times when they're just like eating everything in the house. Well, that's a period of growth for them. They've got to eat because they're growing. And then suddenly their appetite just diminishes because they're not growing right now. But hold on, they'll start growing again and they'll start getting eating everything in sight, right? Well, that was the case spiritually with the children of Israel. God took them from the waters of Merah now to, to Elim, where there was plenty of water, lots of shade, palm trees. It was like, you know, Hawaii and Sinai. So thus it was that the Hebrews came to Elim, where there was plenty of water, where there were 70 palm trees, and those palm trees raised their branches and triumphed to the sky. And so the people took this experience for granted. Now back in Merah, they had murmured and complained. But there in Elim, they didn't do as much as even give thanks to the Lord for his wonderful provision. Don't you find that so often is the case? When we go through trials, we're crying out to the Lord, Lord, save me! And now he brings deliverance and we forget about, you know, what he had done. And now we just start going into cruise mode and everything is fine. And we don't so often think, thank God for the blessing of getting us through the trial and giving us time of peace and rest. So the people continue on. This time, God directs them to a place called the Wilderness of Sin. The Wilderness of Sin. Interesting name. I'm not sure about the significance of that name other than it's just a name. But nonetheless, that's where the Lord took them. So next, the Israelites journeyed to the Wilderness of Sin. And before the people had been thirsty, as was in the case of Merah, now they were hungry. And again, they turned bitterly upon Moses murmuring against him and Aaron for bringing them into the wilderness. And so now for the first time, for the first time, these people wish they were now back in Egypt. How soon they forgot the taskmasters and the tombs that once had loomed so large. And how appetizing the flesh plots of Egypt seemed to be in retrospect. Well, God had brought his people into the wilderness for the express purpose of showing them 
that what this world has to offer cannot feed those who are Canaan bound. The Lord separates us from the world. We're bound for heaven. Now we should have an appetite for different kinds of things, for heavenly things, for spiritual things, because we are heaven bound. So in spite of much murmuring and complaining, God graciously provided in the barren wilderness bread from heaven that they called manna. Now this was an amazing thing, this manna. This manna that God provided was provided in order to sustain the people over a brief period of time until they reached the promised land. Now this manna was never intended to satisfy the appetites of the people. This manna was like today's insure, you know. It's supposed to have all the nutrients and ingredients that are proper, you know, to keep us healthy and so forth like that. It may not be all that appetizing. In fact, it could be really boring over a period of time if you have to keep, you know, maintaining a diet of insure. But the manna was designed to do the same thing. It was just a temporary nourishment for the people. Now, the rest of the story, as we go through the Old Testament, tells us that because of unbelief, that is in Numbers 14 where we have the story, a generation of people was not permitted to enter Canaan, but instead sentenced to a meager life of manna and wandering that lasted for 40 years. God never intended for the people to maintain a diet of manna that long, that period of time. But you know what? There are just many believers who subsist on a diet of manna. They never get past the milk stage of the scriptures. Why? Because they live a compromised life. They get to church eh, maybe two or three times a month at, at best maybe. But it's not vitally important to them. And as a result, they become spiritually malnourished. God never intends for that to be the case with us. So we now have the whole congregation of the children of Israel complaining. They complain against Moses and against Aaron in the wilderness. In the morning, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, the Moses said, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints, which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses spoke to Aaron and said, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before me, before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, we've been talking about looking for words that are repeated, right? Because that's how God emphasizes things. And here you have a lot of words repeated. So what is that? What is God's message to us concerning complaining? If we complain to our boss or to family members or whatever, or we complain even about our own circumstances, who are we really complaining against? Are we not complaining against the Lord? Because he's authored a set of circumstances where we're now at. He put us in a job with maybe a, a, a difficult boss to work for. So when we complain, we're really complaining against the Lord. Because he wants to affect a work in us to build our faith and to make us more and more like Jesus. Your complaints are not against us, Moses said but against the Lord. We've got to remember that, do we not? Look at the book of Philippians. Do all things. What does that include? Do all things without complaining or disputing. That doesn't give us much wiggle room, right, when it comes to complaining. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights and in the world, holding fast the word of life. When we're put into difficult situations, where we're really under pressure, under the gun, so to speak, if we can bear up under all that and what we're facing without complaining, then we have the opportunity to shine of lights in a dark world. Do we not? Just like Jesus, who did not complain, who did not retaliate, 
Boy, did he leave an example for us to follow. And we can also be the same way. We can leave an example for others to follow. So our example. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Be just like him. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He did not revile in return. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. No, he would not do that. He would not do that. What did he do? He committed himself to the Father who judges righteously. Because in the end, the Lord will render a proper judgment. So, going back to our journey, in everything, what does that include? In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You want to know God's will? At least in this one department, we can know it, right? In everything, we are to give thanks. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. Those are pretty clear marching orders, are they not? Going back to the children of Israel, they leave the wilderness of sin, they go to Rephidim, and we're told, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. God purposely led them to a place where there would be no water. Why do you suppose he did that? To test them again, right? So, the people thirsted there for water, and the people did what? They complained against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses, in turn, cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? For they're ready to stone me. You wouldn't want to trade places with Moses, right? <laughs> Doesn't this sound somewhat like the political climate of today? Certainly we do see that. So, what did the Lord do? Well, he said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. And take in your hand your rod, that rod of God, which you struck the river, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. And you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And so Moses did so on the side of the children of, his, of the elders of Israel. Now Paul made mention of this when he wrote to the Corinthians. He said, for they, that is the Israelites, they all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ, another type. When Moses was told to strike that rock, it was a type that spoke of when God allowed his son to be struck. But out of him came that water of life. That water that you and I now partake of. Keeping in view the many complaints that characterize the children of Israel, we must remember too that God will also permit us to go through difficult times. Times in order to test our faith. So that in every situation we are given the following promise. There's no temptation that has overtaken you such as common to man, but God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So you see, it's more than just recorded history in the Old Testament. If you really look at it and study it, you'll learn how God works in our lives. Because doesn't he often send us down the same kind of a road to see what we're really made of, what kind of faith we have, but also for the purpose of building up our faith, making us stronger. Because he wants to build us up in such a way that even though we're going through trials, he wants to make us stronger so that we will face even greater trials and be prepared, prepared and ready for it. So we have some good lessons to learn from the Old Testament. And that's one of the reasons I love the Old Testament. Now, as I mentioned, we won't be meeting next week. 
but I have homework for you. <laughs> homework for you. But I think you're going to have fun with this. I think you'll discover some things that will just be so fascinating to you. Because now that you have the tools to go properly mining for those truths. When we meet back on the 18th, we'll all come together and we'll begin to share the things that God has shown us during these two weeks of being able to apply ourselves to the study of the scriptures. So, let's pass these out. Oh, that's right. We have, do have a time change coming up, right? Yeah. Daylight savings time. Yeah. We spring forward. Go to bed an hour early. Something like that. So again, we're back here on the 18th, and come ready to share what the Lord has shown you, okay? And I think we'll have a good time together, okay? God bless you. Thank you.